Good evening, and welcome to another episode of Unlock the Door Radio. Here with your host, Michael Cross, with UCY TV Productions. Uh, tonight, we are going to have a very special guest. We've had him on before, and that's Sam Bachman, who is an expert on narcissism and psychopathy. And as you know, those people who visited my website at michaelcross.net, I deal with that quite a bit. And tonight, we get a chance to hear from a leading expert in the field. Hello, Sam. Hello, Mike. Thank you for having me yet again. Hey, I just want to start off, before we get into the telltale signs, what's the difference between a psychopath and a narcissist? That's an excellent question. And there are quite a few authorities in the field who believe that their distinctions are distinctions of they are quantitative rather than qualitative. In other words, they, they regard a psychopath as an exaggerated narcissist. Well, that's partly true. They both lie on a spectrum of lack of empathy. So lack of empathy characterizes both. But psychopaths are also usually sadistic. They take, they, they take pleasure in inflicting pain on other people. Some of them even find the infliction of pain funny. So that's one difference. Second difference is that narcissists are capable of controlling their impulses and delaying gratification. They are long-term planners. They are capable of imp implementing career plans and career paths, climbing the corporate ladder, and so on and so forth. So we find narcissists in many positions of power and authority, in politics, in show business, in the corporate world. Psychopaths, on the other hand, are unable to control their impulses and usually unable to delay gratification. And that's why they are overrepresented over in the prison population among criminals. Another thing is that narcissists are more capable of establishing, maintaining, preserving, and nurturing interpersonal relationships. Even though they do it for very selfish reasons, they want to extract narcissistic supply from their nearest and dearest, but they still are capable of maintaining these relationships. Psychopaths are usually not capable of maintaining any long-term relationships. They, are, they, they go for the mark. They hit the person for money or for sex or for other benefits, and then they vanish. And finally, both the psychopath and the narcissist are, in a way, antisocial. In other words, they disregard society, its conventions, social cues, social treaties, they abhor uh, authority. But the psychopath carries this disdain to the extreme. The psychopath is likely to be scheming, calculated, ruthless, callous, and very often career criminal. Narcissists are more, act in more socially acceptable ways. So, so you, narcissists are usually pillars of the community. They are chief executive officers. They, they become presidents and prime ministers while psychopaths end up being bosses of crime families or something similar, con artists. So these are subtle distinctions, admittedly, and I also think that they are the, the distinctions of quantity rather than quality, but some, sometimes quantity counts. Mm -hmm. Okay, so I guess what a lot of people would like to know is how can you tell? What are some of the telltale signs? Let's say 10 telltale signs that you might be either dating, um, let's just specifically say a narcissist, uh, you might have one as a husband or wife, or maybe a member of your family or a close friend. What are the signs that should alert people? Well, first, let's dispel an important myth. There is a myth that narcissists, being the great actors that they are, narcissists are possessed of thespian skills. They are great at putting on a facade. They are great at acting. They are great, you know, and that's all true. So there is this myth that because they are these great actors, it's impossible to tell uh, that someone is a narcissist until well into the relationship. And that is not true at all. Both narcissists and psychopaths emit subtle but totally discernible signs, warning signs, red alerts that should put you on guard, even on a first encounter. And so there are, I would say there are, well, there are, you know, dozens of these, but the important ones are these. 
alloplastic defenses, the tendency to blame every mistake, every failure, every mishap, every misfortune on other people, on the world at large. The inability to assume personal responsibility, to admit to faults and to miscalculations. To, the, these people keep blaming other people. They blame the cab driver, the waiter, the weather, the government, the universe, the CIA, and you. So alloplastic defenses. The second thing, second telltale sign, and you know, these alloplastic defenses are expressed on a first encounter, on a first date. The first time you meet a narcissist or a psychopath, he is likely to rant and rave on how hostile and stupid the world is, on how evil and malicious and calculating his boss is, on how, uh, how his wife doesn't understand him, and so on and so forth. So putting the blame on other people is something that emerges on a first encounter. Second thing is hypersensitivity, or what we call in psychological parlance, hypervigilance. The narcissist and the psychopath, they're hypersensitive. They pick up fights. They feel constantly slighted, injured, insulted. They rant incessantly. They treat weak people, animals, disabled people, sick people, children. They treat them impatiently and cruelly. They express negative or aggressive emotions towards the weak, the poor, the needy, the sentimental, the disabled. So you can see this disdain and this contempt. It, it, it can't be hidden very effectively. No matter how talented you are as an actor, at the end of the day, the narcissist outs. The true figure, the true personality outs. It's there. And if you are alert enough, if you are vigilant, if you are attuned, and if, of course, if you are equipped with the right information, you will be able to spot a narcissist or a psychopath on a first date. Second thing, the uh, third thing is, third sign, is eagerness. The narcissist and the psychopath are always eager. So they push you, they, if you date a narcissist, he pushes you to marry him <laughs> on a first or second date. He's planning to have children with you on the, on the third date. He immediately casts you in the role of the love of his life. He presses you for exclusivity, instant intimacy, sex, and, and he's jealous. He's jealous from the second or third meeting. If you glance at another person, then, you know, he's all, he's all over you. So this eagerness, this insane intensity is typical of narcissists and, and psychopaths. The narcissists and psychopaths do not respect boundaries and do not respect privacy. So they are unlikely, they are very likely, actually, to ignore your wishes. You wish to choose from the menu, he does it for you. You wish to select a movie, he has already booked the, the tickets. You wish to, he, he never consults you. He disrespects your boundaries. He treats you as an object, an instrument of gratification. He materializes on your doorstep unexpectedly. He calls you, he, doesn't, he never calls you prior to, to dropping by. He goes through your personal belongings. He, he texts and phones you multiply, almost like stalking, you know. So this, this lack of respect for your privacy, for your boundaries, for your wishes, for your needs, is, very, is a telltale sign. Narcissists and psychopaths are very controlling and very compulsive. So he insists that you ride in his car, or he insists that, that he should drive, not you. He holds, he holds on to the car keys, the money, the theater tickets, your bag. He disapproves if you go away for too long, too long, you know, by his own lights. He interrogates you when you return. Where have you been? What have you done? He, he tries to limit your ability to meet other people, including friends and family. So he tries to isolate you. He insists on a dress code. He wants you to dress the way he thinks you should, etc., etc. So he's a control freak. Control freakery and compulsiveness are prime signs of narcissism and psychopathy. And narcissists and psychopaths are patronizing and condescending. They criticize very often. They make snide comments and remarks. They emphasize your, your tiniest, minutest faults. They devalue you and other people. But at the same time as they devalue you, at the same time as they harshly and cruelly criticize you, they also exaggerate your talents and your traits and your skills. So they move like a pendulum between idealization, you know, seeing you as the brightest, the most perfect, the love of his life, and so on, on the one hand, and devaluation, criticizing everything you do. You can never be right, you know. 
So this pendulum movement between idealization and devaluation, this cycle is very, very typical of, uh, of a narcissist. And when the narcissist devalues, and especially the psychopath, when they devalue, they're very violent and aggressive. They don't devalue, you know, by just, they, they harass, they ridicule, they call you names, they do it in public usually. The devaluation and idealization mean that the narcissist never sees you for who you really are. When he idealizes you, he is interacting with an object which is in his imagination because you are not ideal. And when he devalues you, he is equally interacting with an object, an avatar in his imagination because you are not that bad. You are not that, such a failure as he makes you out to be. So in both cases, he, you don't exist. He's, he interacts with the representation of you in his mind. And indeed, narcissists and psychopaths are incapable of perceiving other people as full-fledged three-dimensional organisms with their own needs, with their own wishes, fears, dreams, hopes, and preferences. They perceive other people as instruments of gratification, as cardboard cutouts, as avatars, representations in a giant video game, which is called life. So beware and be careful when you meet someone and he immediately tells you that you make him feel good, that you are the love of his life. Don't be impressed because next, next thing he will tell you that it's you who makes him feel bad, that you are responsible for his violence and his aggression, that you provoke him. And finally, I would say um, hints of sadism. That is less typical of narcissists. It's more typical of psychopaths. Hints of sadism. So anything from sadistic sex, uh, fantasies of rape, uh, sexual paraphilias, attraction to porn addiction, attraction to, to minors, forcefulness, uh, ignoring your pleas and, and requests, you know, not hearing the no, um, hurting you physically and finding it amusing, abusing you verbally um, and find that, finding that amusing, uh, and of course physical violence. And, and especially the transition immediately after such humiliations and abuse and battering and aggression, the transition from these to saccharine, loving, apologizing profusely, buying you gifts, groveling, uh, at your feet and so on. Th these transitions are the, the important sign. This impossible dual personality, I don't want to say multiple personality, but sometimes it strikes, it strikes the interlocutor, sometimes it strikes the observer as though narcissists and psychopaths have two personalities, if not more. It's really like some kind of dissociation, dissociative identity disorder. And in my work, I suggest that pathological narcissism is a form of dissociating, dissociative identity disorder, that it is a form of what used to be called multiple personality. And you can't, you know, w w why people don't notice these signs immediately? Because they don't want to. On the dating scene, people are usually desperate. They have been looking, casting the net for so long. They have been alone for so long. They haven't had sex for so many years. They haven't had companionship for decades. So they tend to overlook, they tend to deny, ignore, and suppress any information which may lead them to the inevitable conclusion that they are dating a very mentally sick person. They try to, to uh, they are actually idealize. They idealize. As the narcissist and psychopath idealize them, they idealize the narcissist and psychopath. So they find all kinds of excuses, you know. In, deep inside, he's a nice man. He had a difficult childhood. If I give him love, he will change. He promised to change. He, he loves me a lot. He adores me. You know, they, they tell themselves all, the kind of, all these kind of stupid stories. And I call this phenomenon malignant optimism. Well, it's, it, it seems like in today's society, you have, I don't know, a lot of guys are kind of like, you know, giving up on marriage and commitment. And then, of course, you have a large then number of women whose biological clock is ticking. They're over 30. They have, and then it seems like 
in today's society, then the psychopath and the narcissist has a very happy hunting ground for potential victims. Oh, absolutely. The dating scene is flooded with, flooded with them. The dating scene, online and offline, is a negative filter. It filters out the more balanced, healthy individuals. These usually find a mate via uh, third parties, via uh, word of mouth, via recommendations. They, they are well integrated into the social fabric. They have their own social networks. And through these, they find the appropriate mate. Narcissists and psychopaths are hunters. They are predators. And so the, the dating scene is a filter through which only or mostly narcissists and psychopaths uh, you know, emerge. And uh, you're absolutely right. Okay. Now, I have, heard, I have heard a lot of people who've been in relationships with uh, psychopaths and at least psychopaths. I don't know about narcissists, but uh, I've read where a lot of them, they feel that the experience itself, when they were in the relationship, the sex was fantastic. Uh, they may have lived a repressed lifestyle, and all of a sudden, this person is showing them an entirely new world, uh, getting them to go beyond their preset boundaries. And so in the relationship itself, it's, it's something that a lot of people get a real adrenaline uh, push from. Do you find that to be the case? I find that there is a class of human being, class of persons, women and men, especially women, who are attracted to, to spouses or to mates or to intimate partners uh, as a form of an adventure. They, they, they regard their life as a kind of black and white movie, and here is this guy injecting it with, uh, with Technicolor and with uh, excitement and with an adrenaline rush, repeated adrenaline rushes, and uh, with the unexpected and with a twilight zone. And they, so this propensity to gravitate towards the risky, towards the slightly frightening, towards the exciting is there, but again, it's a filter. A small minority of people are like that. And had they not paired up with a narcissist and a psychopath, they would have ended up racing cars or climbing mountains or providing aid to Ebola patients or what have you. This is the need, the need to constantly experience life on the edge. And the narcissist and psychopath is a shortcut, dating the narcissist and living with the psychopath, pairing up with them, teaming up, establishing a couple with them. It's a shortcut towards achieving this, the, the constant doses of adrenaline that these junkies need. They're adrenaline junkies. So yes, if you talk to these people, they would say that the relationship with the psychopath and the narcissist has been harrowing that they have been abused and so on and so forth, but it was a very fascinating, interesting period. And now they feel dead inside because nothing is happening. Now they're dating a, a stable, healthy guy, and it, it's boring. It's boring, it's black and white, it's predictable, and uh, they're dying. They, they, um, they feel like they're dying slowly, incrementally, but it's, it's death creeping up on them. And they go out, then they, they break up the relationship and they go, up, go out seeking the next dose, seeking the pusher known as narcissist or psychopath. But these are highly specific people. As I just told you, these, some of them date narcissists and psychopaths, other, others climb mountains or race cars, and others end up being drug addicts. So it's a highly specific profile. I would not generalize. Okay. Uh, can a narcissist or a psychopath actually be a good marriage partner, though? I mean, in, in some cases, depending on if they're raised in a very committed family situation, can they in turn uh, be committed to their partner? Absolutely. Uh, in one of the chapters of my book, Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, I discuss the phenomenon of stable narcissists. Most narcissists, actually, 
have an island of stability in their lives. And so there is this island of stability surrounded by an ocean of instability. So, for example, some narcissists are committed to a career path within a specific company or corporation. So they climb the corporate ladder very patiently. They invest in their work. They're, they are workaholics, actually. They, and, you know, 30 years later, they are the chief executive officers of the company. They started working in the company when they were 19. At the age of 50, they are the chief executive officers. So this is an example of stability. They're, they have an island of stability, which is their workplace. Politicians are the same. They start at an early age, and 30 years later, they are senators and governors and presidents. And this requires commitment, investment, long-term planning, and stability of character and of performance. And so all narcissism, or the vast majority of narcissists, have an island of stability. Now, the island of stability could well be the family. A narcissist could be very committed to his intimate partner and to his children throughout a decades-long relationship. He can have a very stable marriage, never divorce, never cheat, be a dedicated father, a loving or simulated loving husband, and so on and so forth, and this could go on for 30 or 40 or 50 years. But then the same narcissist would be unstable in all other areas of his life. So he would change jobs very frequently. He would embark on harebrained schemes. He would lose his money. He would go bankrupt 10 times. He would relocate and dislocate and move from city to city, from town to town, from state to state, and so on and so forth. So the island of stability is usually compensated for by instability in all other areas of life. You, the narcissist could be stable in his family life and totally unstable in his work, working life, or he can be stable in his working life and get married, divorced, and remarried seven times. So, yes, the answer to your question is yes, but it highly depends on where the narcissist establishes his island of stability. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, this sounds controversial, but can, can a person spot narcissism and psychopathy in, like, children? No. Absolutely not. Uh... To start with, narcissism, healthy narcissism, is the sine qua non of personal growth and development between the years zero and six. This, uh, Freud called it primary narcissism. Narcissism is therefore very important for the establishment of a sense of self-worth, the emergence of self-esteem, and the acquisition of self-confidence in the formative years, which are zero to six. Then between the ages of 6 and 13 or 6 and 12, prior, let's say, until early adolescence, including early adolescence, narcissism is very important as a way to individuate and separate. The adolescent learns to separate himself from his parents or from his caregivers, to individuate, to become an individual by way of contradistinction. And in order to do that, that's a very frightening and harrowing task. You know, throughout your life, as a toddler, then as a child, you have learned to merge and to fuse with your parents. Your parents are the most important figures in your life. They are the caregivers. They are the providers. Without, without whom, you might as well be dead. And I mean literally, not figuratively. So dependence on the parents Merging with the parents, securing their love, is the paramount task of the toddler and the child. And then in early adolescence, there's a seismic, seismic break. In early adolescence, the child, the hitherto child, should learn to disengage, to detach, to create a fault, fault line. It's the equivalent of an earthquake. That's why I call it a seismic break. He, he should learn to become his own person and to disengage from the parental influence and the parental presence. To do that, the adolescent needs to be narcissistic. Narcissism is a very important tool in separation and individuation in early adolescence. 
So, it would be totally meaningless to diagnose pathological narcissism until the age of 13, 14, maybe 15. Because the narcissistic behaviors and traits, which are very typical of adolescents, very typical of toddlers and young children, are actually healthy. Not so with psychopathy. Psychopathy can be, or the precursors, to be precise, the precursors, the, the antecedents of psychopathy, can be diagnosed at an early age. Actually, there is a diagnosis in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. It's called Conduct Disorder. Conduct Disorder is psychopathy for children. Children psychopaths are diagnosed with Conduct Disorder and Oppositional Defined Disorder. So there are children who torture animals and find it very delectable, pleasurable, and funny. They, they despise and abhor authority, and so they are very defined to the point of destructiveness. They are destructive, destructive of objects, of relationships. They are, their behavior is criminalized and antisocial. They tend to hang out in gangs, to commit crimes, petty crimes. Some of them are very violent, and they take out their violence on siblings, and uh, neighbors and so on. So we have the telltale signs of psychopathy in early, even in early childhood. And the reason is the psychopathy is more and more considered to be a disorder of the brain, similar to depression or to schizophrenia, schizophrenia paranoia. These used to be thought of as mental health problems, but today we know that depression, mood disorders, schizophrenia, paranoia, and probably psychopathy are the outcomes of biochemical imbalances in the brain. And therefore, they can safely be diagnosed at an early age because brain biochemistry is almost fully determined by year nine or 10 of life. Not so with narcissism. Narcissism is a highly complex phenomenon which involves probably some biochemical exp manifestations in the brain, involves probably some genetic background, there's probably an array of genes which is responsible for the development of narcissism. I don't doubt that, and I don't doubt that it manifests in the brain in highly specific ways, but narcissism also includes a whole panoply of behaviors and traits that put together create such a complex construct that it cannot be reduced to any specific biochemical in the brain or to any specific gene or group of genes. And this is why it's not safe, it's impossible actually, to diagnose narcissistic personality disorder in anyone younger than 13, 14, and I would say 15. Okay, interesting. Now, you earlier mentioned, I have to bring this up again, but I heard a couple of your interviews here, one of them on Israeli radio. Uh, you brought up something about politicians, and you, you seem to indicate that you believe that Obama displays a lot of narcissistic traits. Yes, in July 2008, before he became president of the United States, uh, he was at the time a senator. Uh, he caught my eye. I, I was roving, as is my habit, on YouTube. And suddenly I saw this video of a young uh, black politician, um, you know, gesturing and talking and so on. I said, my God, this guy has the body language of a narcissist, you know. Who is this guy? And I, I started watching videos featuring Barack Obama. Uh, again, very important to, to realize that when I started studying the guy in 2006, there was not a hint that he would be the president of the United States. I did not study him because he became president of the United States. I published the article suggesting that he is a narcissist before he became president of the United States. And, and so I gradually, I ended up watching hundreds of hours of Barack Obama. He fascinated me for, for a variety of reasons. But I, I was able to discern um, analytically several features which are usually 
typical of narcissists. For instance, pronoun density, first person pronoun density, the use of I, my, myself, and mine in speeches. I notice that his pronoun density is very high. He uses the words I, my, myself, mine very frequently, very often. Mind you, not more often than the typical politician, but up to 50 times more often than a normal person. And that tells you a lot about politicians in general, yes? And so that was a sign. Another sign was his body language, his haughty, you know, superior, the vision thing, body language. That was also a telltale sign. Then there were other issues, his uh, chaotic childhood. It's usually uh, an excellent predictor of the emergence of personality disorders. His childhood was in, indescribably, indescribably unstable and chaotic. You know, he was thrown from parent to parent to grandmother to he crisscrossed cultures and societies well before the age of 10 and diametric, diametrically opposed cultures and societies. So such a chaotic, dysfunctional childhood is usually a, a very good predictor of mental health problems in later life, especially personality disorders, and so on and so forth. I don't want to go into this whole long rigmarole, but I analyzed these hundreds of hours of videos, and I've reached a conclusion that he might be, and I framed my initial article very carefully. I said, Barack Obama, narcissist or merely narcissistic? I, I, came, I suggested that he might be a narcissist, and that was in, the first article was published in July 2008, and created a firestorm when he became president. Long afterwards, a year later, the article was rediscovered and created a firestorm among conservative talk show hosts and, you know, inevitably the Republican Party and its, and its more radical base, red states, and so on and so forth. Okay. If, if, if he were indeed narcissistic, we see a lot of things going on right now in the world in regards to Russia. Uh, mm-hmm. That it seems that it, it, there's not a real agenda, not a real plan. Um, is it because if he was narcissistic that perhaps he feels slighted by Putin for like a year ago? Putin was considered the, on the front of the world stage and had usurped him in regards to Syria and some of these other issues? I don't think it is either safe or recommended to apply a specific mental health pathology, to apply a mental health pathology to specific geopolitical situations because the number of considerations and the complexity of arguments which go into the formation of a policy, especially in a country as bureaucratic, as complex, as hyperstructured as the United States, the number of arguments and considerations that go into the feed, feed into the decision making machine, um, these usually overshadow any specific pathology in the decision maker. Barack Obama may be the ultimate decision maker, but he's definitely not the only decision maker. And he is definitely not even the most decisive, important decision maker. The United States has a system of checks and balances, which, far, which goes far beyond Congress and, and the executive branch and so on. There are lobbies, there are industries, there are, you know, there's a million, it's, it's, it's uh, the most, the most amazing empire that the world had ever seen, dwarfing anything that came before it. So to, to imply that, that the policy towards Russia, for instance, or China, or North Korea, or whatever, is the embodiment of Barack Obama's pathology would be a bit childish, I would say, and, and unsafe. However, what is happening between Barack Obama, for instance, and Congress is an expression of Barack Obama's personality and any pathology he may possess, his inability to collaborate, his conflictive and confrontative nature, his, his propensity for confrontation, his endless posturing as a victim, 
he's putting the blame on others constantly and consistently, including for the recent defeat in the elections, in the by-elections, yes? So all these things are typical of narcissistic pathology. And I have actually predicted his behavior in, in, in detail in interviews that I've granted as early as 2009. That's five years ago. I've been able to predict his, beha- his current behavior uh, five years ago. And it's not because I'm such a genius or endowed with divine powers, but it's simply because the unfolding and expression of the narcissistic pathology is immutable. It's always the same. It's very easy to predict the self-destruction, the self-defeating, and the other destruction that narcissistic pathologies bring in their wake. So Barack Obama's relationship with Congress, with his own nation, with himself, these things are within Barack Obama's exclusive power. And where Barack Obama is the exclusive decision maker, his pathology manifests 100% of the time and 100% accurately. So his relationship with Congress, coming back full circle, his relationship with Congress could have been and has been predicted years ago. He is driving the United States towards a constitutional crisis predicated not on some kind of uh, constitutional deep thinking or not on some brinkmanship uh, that has to do with his wish to uh, reformulate or reframe the United States or none of this. He is driving the United States towards a constitutional crisis because of his personality because he, is, he has ideas of reference. In other words, he regards himself as the butt and the victim of unjust treatment, ridicule, and abuse. Because he, he is never to blame or is never responsible for anything. Everyone else is to blame. Congress is to blame. His party is to blame. Everyone else is to blame. He is, he is always right. He's never wrong. I don't know if you noticed that. You can't show me a, second, a, a single mea culpa of Barack Obama single case where he says, I have been wrong. I have done something wrong. After the elections a few months ago, instead of saying, you know, I screwed up. I'm the least popular president in the history of the United States, and there must be a reason for that. I have done things wrongly. Instead of that, he said, he blamed Congress. He said, the people sent us a message about the dysfunctioning of Congress. It was Congress that the people had punished, not him, not his party. So, all these things are very indicative of deep-set narcissistic pathology, and I'm sorry and frightened to say that the end is nigh and very predictable. Barack Obama is going to drive the United States domestically. I don't think you should concentrate on Russia, Iraq, Italy, or Germany. These are not the main issues. The main issue is what Barack Obama is doing to the United States within the United States. How he he is, owing to his very sick personality, dismantling the structures that the Founding Fathers put wisely and sagely in place, how he is dismantling these just in order to satisfy his vindictive urge for self-gratification and self-justification. This is something narcissists are incapable of controlling. These are impulses that are stronger than they are, the need to uphold the false self, the grandiose self-image, the inflated self-perception, the belief that they are always right. And they would sacrifice anything to prove that, including their own country, nation, and ultimately, as you know, we have seen in other, case, other cases of other leaders, ultimately they would even sacrifice themselves. Wow. Well, that's certainly... Uh... That sounds like it uh, could be a real roller coaster for the next two years. Hello, then. Mike. I can't hear. Oh, it sounds like Mike. I haven't heard the last sentence. I'm afraid. Huh? Can okay, you hear me now? I haven't heard the last sentence. Yes, I can hear you now. Okay, it sounds like that the United States then is in for a real roller coaster of a ride for the next two years. Sure is. Sure is. Wow. 
Okay, well, you know, we're coming up to the end of our time now. Uh, where can people find more information about uh, your book and and uh, your website and these sorts of things? Uh, before, with your permission, before I, I respond to this last generous question, I would like to quote a giant, a towering giant of, person, of the field of personality disorders, Theodore Millen. He wrote in his, uh, in his book, Personality Disorders uh, in Modern Life, he wrote this, when the egocentricity, lack of empathy, and sense of superiority of the narcissist cross-fertilize with the impulsivity, deceitfulness, and criminal tendencies of the antisocial, the result is a psychopath, an individual who seeks the gratification of selfish impulses through any means without empathy and without remorse. These two sentences summarize a universe of knowledge about narcissists and psychopaths. I'm the author of Malignant Self-Love, Narcissism Revisited, and my website is http uh, narcissistic hyphen abuse dot com backslash and that's it. You can simply search my name, Google my name, Sam Sam Vaknin, V A K N I N, or Google malignant self love. I will come up. Hey, excellent. I'll put some links there to some of your work as well when this goes up on YouTube. Well, thank you kindly, and, and don't forget to send me the YouTube file so that I can upload it to my own channel. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, that uh, we're coming up to the very end here. Uh, thank you for your time, Sam. And thank you for having me, work. and Happy New Year to everyone. Yes, and you stay too. away. Stay and, away from narcissists. <laughs> yes, and, and also any of that might be in my listening audience. <laughs> and all. <the> <laughs> anyway, thank you, and uh, take care, everyone.